PMI Code d'Azure is delighted to welcome you in this webinar. Uh, since the beginning of this uh, COVID-19 PMI France has been trying to propose a large event of webinars uh, through uh, branches and polls, is pleased today to propose conferences at all its members. Um, so today we are really pleased to have uh, this webinar about digital transformation. Uh, this webinar will be registered, so uh, all your questions and answers uh, will be sent by email at the end. So even the ones that would not be handled during the conference. We have today 102,000 participants, uh, sorry, uh, 1,200 participants, uh, and we will thank you all for your uh, participation. Uh, prior to our main subject, I will let uh, Olivia Fraget present us the PMI and its chapter. So, Olivia, please. Hello, everyone. So, I will tell uh, more about you about the PMI uh, front chapter and uh, the branch, and also what we are doing at PMI. PMI.org. Uh, here is, is uh, our bright team. So, uh, for sure, not all about the team because uh, you know we are many and many. Uh, please go next. Uh, but what we are doing I, at uh, PMI.org, we we are promoting project management. How do we are we going to that? We are giving power to the project economy trying to strengthen society by enabling organization and empower individuals to make idea a reality. The idea is really that we use the community uh, to support everyone as a member, as a participant, as a volunteer. In three more big values, we are doing that. We are fearless, bright and nurturing. We are not afraid of the Ewing's new approach. Uh, you have seen that maybe uh, in the last uh, version six of the PMBOK, for example, we are now using more agility and so on. And the next uh, version of uh, seven, we will uh, talk about that a little bit uh, after, is also a new one. So we are really using new approach inside and outside of the PMI. We are bright in a way that we are trying to energize the people to make a difference for them, to make difference in their career, in their impact to the community, in their impact with the people they are working with. And also we are really trying to, to help the people to go to their, um, to their objective, personal and professional objective. So that's a, a big, uh, big journey that we are using in the community. About PMI, just uh, simple figures. I will not maybe go through many details of it because, uh, but uh, simple to, to here to give you a bit of an idea of uh, how big is PMI.org. Uh, there are more than uh, six uh, million of uh, PMBOK, that is uh, the, PM, uh, the PMI reference for the PMP certification that are distributed today and used more than 1 million people certified uh, in all the, um, all the project management uh, certification that you have. And it's really a worldwide, um, worldwide um, a community and uh, association so that, we, that we are using. And um, using it in more than 2,080 2, countries. So that's really a big community. Uh, because we are so big, we are proposing uh, several. Here are some of the 20 standards and reference that you can find. And also on the website, you can download it. When you are a member, then it, it's, it's free to download it. And then you can have more, many more than these references uh, on the website. The idea is that as we are so big and in so many countries, uh, when we want to, uh, you know, to, to have a community that is um, near to the people and to communicate, and uh, we need to be more local also. So that's why we have so many uh, countries and so many chapters. Um, the idea is that here we have the chapter France. Uh, here is a team of the chapter France. And the chapter France has been uh, created in 1995. And from this, uh, this date, we are trying to promote the same as the value I show you before, but locally in France. Here are um, an idea of where we stand 
on the on the number of members that we have in our chapter we are proud of it and also in the in the class that we have uh, regarding the all uh, the chapter in uh, in the world so we can see that throughout the fourth uh, chapter with more than uh, 500 members so that's really great and uh, what is being a members Yes, so being a member is um, the value that being a member it can be that you have, for example, free or reduced uh, to more than 200 hours. Uh, to, uh, it gives you unity that we are naming PDUs, like for today, for example, if you have a member, if you are a member of uh, our PMI association, then uh, you will have a PDU for your certification. You also have more than uh, hours on it. You have also many resources that you can find on our web websites. Uh, you have also a community, uh, as you said, as more than, you have specialists and more than 5,000 project management specialists that you can exchange with. Also what you can have is free access to template different resources advice webinars or website as the webinar of today for example and also many uh, other things like reduction on uh, certification uh, prices and so on so that's some of the value that you can have as being a member so if you are not yet a member do not hesitate to join okay. to join do not hesitate to ask directly to us, uh, to email us, or to go directly on, on the website, pmifrance.org. Um, uh, here are also uh, some uh, scan codes that you can, uh, some codes that you can scan if you want to go there. And on, on this website, you will have, uh, even if you are not uh, yet a member, you will have many information to know, to know more. And uh, yes, uh, to give you a little bit of the next um, conference that will be after this one, uh, we have a program of many conferences. The really the good value that we have uh, with the sanitary crisis now is that uh, all our webinars are in a remote and you can uh, directly uh, benefit of it. So the next one uh, will be on the BMBOK. I, I was telling you that uh, we have uh, we have now it, it will be I guess free. Uh, soon, the PMBOK V7 uh, V7 of of the so he we had uh, a presentation of it uh, last month, and uh, at the end of the month next week you will have the backstage of uh, the preparation of it. So it will be really uh, really interesting. Then uh, another branch of uh, of the PMI um, that is Grenoble the, the, will uh, will propose you. And if I was blocking my project from emotion, so something that, you know, also we are not only using project management uh, art skill, we are also going through soft skills and so on. And the same as uh, the t group workers said that we will propose you from the PMI uh, branch uh, Côte d'Azur, the same as today. And also in, uh, in May uh, 19, you will have uh, the PMI Nord, Nord that will give you uh, uh, one hour inside PMI. So that's uh, some of the that's the next uh, conferences that you will find on our program on on the front chapter. Do not hesitate also to go with to the website to know more about it and to register to them. I want to th to thanks uh, every of our partners also. So thank you to all the national. Uh, French chapter uh, partners and also to our local uh, Côte d'Azur branch uh, partners, uh, especially uh, today to our uh, great and uh, for a long time uh, partner that is EDEC Business School, that is one of uh, the business school that is that stand in the Sofia Antipolis and is also brightening uh, really um, great in the area and all around the world. And I will um, keep the world, uh, give the word to, to Lenka because she will present it uh, more um, better than me, I guess. Hello, a very pleasant afternoon or evening to every one of you. Um, thank you for being with us today. My name is Lenka Bachila. I am an EDEC MBA student and president of the MBA Project Management Club. And it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here today. 
Before we get started, I would like to share a couple of words about the EDEC MBA, our club and our partnership with PMI. EDEC MBA, Global MBA, is an intense 10-month program offered by EDEC, which is one of the top 15 European business schools. The Global MBA ranked as top three in France, top 20 in Europe and 76 worldwide. Our cohorts are very international and diverse. We have around 30 nationalities in cohorts of 60 to 65 students. The average age is around 32 years. And before our MBA, we have acquired several years of experience. So now you are probably wondering about where the program takes all the students after their graduation. So the career paths are very diverse. Our alumni pursue their career and functions ranging from finance, marketing and operations to general management and also across multiple sectors from consulting, healthcare, financial services, consumer goods and luxury or technology. And our top tier employers include companies like Amazon, BCG, Deloitte, Estee Lauder, Sodexo or Microsoft. Many graduates choose small and mid-sized companies, including emerging startups. And around 11% of EDEC MBAs start their own companies. That current class will enter a very challenging market in the next two months. So please reach out to us if you search for your next intern or full-time hire. We are very good. And thanks to studying in one of the most diverse MBA student bodies, our student clubs are a fantastic opportunity to find inspiration from fellow students and get insights from professionals and industry leaders. The Project Management Club is a great example. Thanks to more than five years long partnership with PMI Côte d'Azur and on behalf of the club, I am proud to host this event today here with all of you. We are honored to have our guest speakers with us, with us today all three have unique stories and experience to share. The first is Karin collins Ketar, professor, professor of Strategy and Innovation at EDEC Business School and member of the Chair for Foresight, Innovation and Transformation. Next, Nicola Cloca, Group Regional Director of France, Spain and Benelux at Unilabs and alumnus of EDEC Business School. And Christina Monoye, Operations Division's Global Digital Transformation Director at L'Oreal. Thank you for being with us here today. And lastly, without taking any more of your time, I call Karin and our guest speakers to introduce themselves to you and start discussing their experience and insight. Prepare yourself to learn about the imperatives for successful digital transformation. And thank you again for being here. Enjoy this event. Thank you so much, Nenka, for that introduction, and thank you to the PMI and uh, and the EDEC uh, Project Management Club for preparing, organizing, uh, and marketing this event. I see we are now 559 people, so that's amazing. I've seen 36 countries on the list of attendees, or at least of registries. Um, and we have people from all industries, from banking, from consulting, from, from heavy industries, uh, IT, um, well, I've got um, utilities, pharma, energy. So I'm extremely de delighted to have a discussion and to show you some of the main challenges uh, around digital transformation, how to overcome them. We've looked at the topic and we've seen that in 2021, digital transformation is one of the top three priorities for 75% of CEOs of top 1,600 global companies. That has increased, of course, due to the pandemics, because we've all seen that during the pandemic, those who are digital leaders achieved earning growth that were more than two um, times higher than the earning growth growth, sorry, of digital laggards. But what is quite surprising, um, and uh, probably a reason for the fact that we've got 500 people attending this uh, seminar, is that only 30% of digital uh, transformation projects actually reach their objectives, according to a recent by, survey by McKinsey. 
30% fail completely, so that means they reach less than 50% of their objectives, and 30% create only limited long-term value. So this is why we're gonna look at what are the main challenges? So we're gonna hear from our, from our uh, guest speakers, uh, and then, of course, we're gonna, we would also like to hear from you. What are the challenges that you are facing? Um, and then we're gonna move on and discuss how we can overcome those challenges. I will share as we go along findings uh, from literature, from research about the main objective of digital transformation, uh, the challenges, the main challenges that companies worldwide um, encounter and recommendations on how to increase the chances of the success of your digital transformation. So I'm extremely happy to be joined by uh, Christina and Nicola, and I would just uh, quickly hand over to, uh, to Christina to, to introduce herself, tell us um, a little bit about her background and about her current, current role at uh, L'Oréal. Christina, please. Uh, thank you, Karen. Hello, um, I'm very happy to be here today and thank you for having me. I'm Spanish um, and I grew up in Barcelona until the age of 20 something where I came to Paris to uh, study and I have a double degree in engineering that I complete with a master on supply chain and then an MBA at Institut Francais de la Monde. I've been working at L'Oréal for about 20 years and I'm currently in charge of digital transformation of operations. And I will probably say afterwards what exactly it's operations at L'Oréal. Thank you so much, Christina. Nicola, what about yeah, you? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's, good to, it's good to be back at the school, uh, which is, of course, one of the best schools on the planet. Um, so I'm, I've been uh, you know, in healthcare for more than 20 years. Um, I graduated from uh, EDEC Business School in 96. And after seven years in marketing on the product management, uh, I went to do an MBA in the US and I worked for the last 17 years in healthcare, uh, 15 years in Johnson & Johnson in different uh, leadership role in, uh, in, in, in Latin America, in, in Europe, in emerging market. And I joined in Labs three years ago as uh, initially the CEO of France. And for the last year, I'm in charge of the region uh, South, which is Benelux, Spain and France. Thank you, Nicola. Maybe just a few words about myself, uh, besides the fact that I'm a professor of strategy. Um, maybe it's interesting for you to know that I haven't been in academia for my whole life. I've started my career in consulting um, with the Boston Consulting Group. So some of the sources that I'm going to use today are also from, from these kind of companies, BCG, McKinsey, ABL, where I've also spent some time and then moved uh, into te telecoms industry, uh, where I was um, in strategy positions uh, in the Deutsche Telekom group for about 10 years. Um, and besides being a professor today, I'm also an entrepreneur. I work a bit still as a consultant, but very much as a facilitator and keynote speaker, um, very often for telecoms company, but not only. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy and lucky to be able to work pretty much throughout the world, quite a bit in Africa, Asia, uh, and in Europe, well, now with the pandemic, that's much easier. There's much less uh, traveling necessary. So, well, let's jump right into uh, our discussion. And um, I would like to ask you, Nicola, to start with you, because uh, because probably most of us are familiar with L'Oreal and, and use some of the products, but not all of us know what Unilabs is all about. So. Could you start by providing our audience uh, an insight into Unilabs? What are you doing? Um, and the digital transformation journey that you've been leading for the last probably five years, almost 10 maybe? Go ahead, Nicola. Sure. So, so Unilabs, we, we are one of the largest uh, diagnostic provider in Europe. Uh, we are present in 17 countries. We have more than 13,000 employees. Uh, for a turnover of around 1.4 billion last year. Uh, we have 1,000 doctors. This is basically where you go to do your lab tests or your X-ray or your biopsy. We are really present in three dimensions of the diagnostic and uh, you know, laboratory uh, test, genetics, imaging, and pathology. You know, that's really who we are. And uh, we are you know, present in 17 countries in Europe. Um, in terms of uh, digital transformation, as, as discussed by Skarin, I think there's many places, I would say, in our company 
uh, where we are taking our team through uh, digital transformation. I think digital transformation, of course, is, is everywhere and is also very present in healthcare. Today, I think I will really focus on some concrete examples. And, you know, listening and, and preparing for this session, I, I really want to explain a bit what we've, do, we've done, for example, in the, the digital pathology sectors, you know. Um, what is very, what, what is a major concern in this environment is uh, you have a decline of pathologists, uh, aging population. I think there's a decline between 2010 and 2015. There's been a decline of 11% and 63% uh, of the pathologists have more than 55 years old. So really, the you know the, the labor of the doctors is declining. Uh, the, the offer is declining. Why you have an increase of cancer cases? You know uh, there is an increasing demands. And, and if you use the old way, which is really uh, you know doctors looking at tissue with a microscope, you know you would have a major cha challenge. So that's why we we had to rethink the pathology on on really digitalize on digitize uh, you know the, the the slides that the the pathologists were looking at and transform the way the pathologists were, were working. Uh, and this is really opening the full scope on opportunity of the digitalization, because when you digitalize the, the slides, you can really work from anywhere. Um, you know, you have remote access, as we know, you can also specialize, which is also a, a big benefit for, for doctors. You can do second reading, which is increasing quality. Uh, and you have, you know, all the, you know, the, the, the opportunity also to use artificial intelligence. So in total, I think it's really bringing, uh, incre you know, improving the quality of, of, of care at the end of the day. So I think that's uh, really the journey we are on, Karin, uh, in the, the pathology sector. Okay, that's very interesting. So basically, if I understand you correctly, Unilabs is actually about to transform its core business uh, and the processes. And the good news is that that is also enhancing the, 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 the value proposition for your customers. And, well, you've got two types of customers, the doctors on the one hand side, but also the, the patients, uh, so the main end customers on the other hand side. Uh, it, exactly. Is that correct? Thank you. Okay, so that gives us already a first uh, point of view of a main objective of digital transformation. Uh, transform the core to enhance your value proposition in the customer experience. To you now, Christina. Um, you're leading Laura's global uh, digital transformation in operations. Maybe you could tell us a little bit what operations look like um, and then what exactly you're transforming and how you're doing that. Sure, Karen. Yes, I know that L'Oreal is quite a known company and, and uh, in France, even if it's a multinational brand and with lots of uh, positions everywhere. Uh, operations at L'Oreal are all the business units around the um, technical product design, sourcing, production and supply chain. In a few key figures, we uh, produce 7 billion products per year in our around 40 factories that we distribute through our 150 delivery uh, distribution centers, sorry. Um, and this is our playground somewhere, that's what we call operations. Um, and back in 2016, we started our digital transformation by crossing very simply the new consumer insights. They want everything, anything, anytime, anywhere. They are more and more conscious on the impact on the planet. Uh, they want experience, they want personalization, and we cross this new consumer insights we have a value chain and we came to five big pillars of transformation. One is how we can reduce our time to market um, to launch new products much quicker. The second one is how we can create this kind of hot link between the product and our consumers to give them much more information about the product, how I can use it, uh, where it doesn't come from, how I can sort it at the end of life cycle, etc. The third one is how we can be much more agile in our operations. The fourth one is how we can um, bring experience in personalization through uh, uh, you know, formulas only for you after a diagnosis, whatever the diagnosis. And fifth, how we can leverage all this data that we have, uh, both on knowledge on our skin and hair, but also on all the operations uh, data. So back in, in 2016, we started this transformation. And maybe I can illustrate um, 
in, in, in two very specific points. So in order to reduce our time to market, there's one phase, what we call ideation, where there's lots of exchanges between marketing and operations team to make to exchange around one idea of a, of a project. And we do some mockups and it takes time to exchange about this mockup, make sure that it's the right one with the right size, that it goes through our production lines, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We have massified the use of 3D printing for fast prototyping and that allows us to reduce uh, dramatically the time of ideation because we can have a meeting with the marketing teams uh, during the night of a night print, the mockup we have been working on, and the day after we can say whether it's you know the right size, the right shape, whether we can to fine tune, etc. Et and these iterations are much more uh, quicker because you can reduce the, this time. This is one example. So 3D printing, this technology is, uh, I mean, massively implemented in all our uh, design uh, labs. The second one, and, and we were ready before COVID and we're happy of that, but it has been really um, a, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, much more used during during the, the, the this crisis, is what we call the remote assist with the HoloLens uh, tool. So HoloLens 2 is just, you know, glasses on uh, augmented reality that allow us to be remotely close to the person which faces one problem. We have several, um, several use cases. One of them is simply, I'm on the production line. I have an issue with my production line. My technician is not on the factory. It's maybe in another factory, maybe at home. Or, and then I can call them through um, NAC. He gives me instructions and I see through my glasses what exactly, what button I have to put on or off. And so make sure I can prepare, let's say the, in that way, uh, the production line so I can uh, continue with my production. So very concrete example on how we can use technologies uh, and how we transform ourselves in our meetings. Thank you so much, Christina. So what we see here, what we see at L'Oreal is, is the case of a company that is using digital transformation to optimize the operations and augment them. Now, the, the main examples for, for optimization is, for example, speeding up uh, processes. Uh, Christina has said that they are, one of their objectives is to reduce the time to market, very typical uh, objective of digital transformation projects. Another one is, would be to enhance the decision taking. Um, and a third one uh, would be to reduce the cost, which certainly is for many companies or for L'Oreal more a byproduct um, because they are focusing on more on the augmentation part uh, of, of, this, uh, of this particular objective. So what you see here is what we find in research is that there are three main areas that digital transformation um, targets. It's the optimization of the existing company, it's the enhancement of the value proposition of the customer experience, and we've also seen examples here at, at L'Oreal and at, uh, at uh, Unilabs. And the third one, which we haven't seen yet, um, is uh, about developing a new business model. And probably many of you, are, well, all of you, I assume, are aware of the move, the digital transformation that Netflix has, has gone through from shipping DVDs uh, that people rented to now being the biggest streaming platform. But there are also much more subtle uh, ones like um, Bridgestone, a tire company that has moved from focusing on the production and the sales of tire to selling tire as a service. And in order to be able to do that, they've, they've bought a telematics company, TomTom, Tom, um, which allows them to, um, to know in advance when a, a, a tire needs to be, to be changed. Uh, so I'm talking about relatively big companies there, but we also see very small companies. And um, an example I like to talk about because I've worked with them uh, is Bossard, a, a fastening company. So they, they used to sell nuts and bolts and screws um, and they've turned into, into a, a supply chain logistics provider. Uh, also now for, 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 for companies and sectors that don't use their nuts and bolts and screws like hospitals. So now I would like to turn the question to you, uh, and uh, we're going to start with the first poll, please. And I would like you to tell us what is the number one objective of the digital transformation that you are part of? So is it more focusing on optimization and augmentation of the current business? So better decision, better processes to reduce costs uh, or to enhance the, the, the core of your business? 
Is it about enhancing uh, value propositions or the customer experience? Is it mainly to develop new business models or is it something else? And if it's something else, please uh, type it into the Q&A because I've seen the chat is not necessarily open for all of you. Um, well, let's take a minute to see um, what the number one objective of your digital transformation project is about. All right, we already have the, the results. So half of you uh, is really about transforming the core, um, making what you're doing better, uh, faster, and optimizing it. 40% uh, around uh, the enhancement of the value proposition, so very close to what Nicolas has been talking about, and only 10% uh, about developing new business models. So that's quite interesting because when we look at the top 1,600 companies that I've mentioned before, um, based on a, the most innovative company report that has just been published this week by the Boston Consulting Group, we see that over time, companies move from focusing on the optimization and augmentation of the core to development of new business models. Um, so most likely, uh, if you're today focusing on transforming your core, uh, in a year, two years, or three years of now, you're, you'll be also thinking about how can we use a digital technology to transform our revenue, to transform our business model, um, and add additional uh, business models to our to our topic. Let's move to the second part. Thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, discuss the challenges um, that that we find um, that we find with. Um, um, <clears throat> digital transformation. Now, um, I will probably hand it over right away to Christina, um, who is working mainly in the area that is the most common amongst our audience, namely the optimization and augmentation of the core of your business, to ask her what are the main challenges that you are facing at L'Oreal, Christina? Um, I would say in my area, and again, I'm in operations, and I'm not talking about oh, L'Oreal. And uh, L'Oreal has another a lot of other other transformation and digital transformation with other services and and, and amazing products. And if you go to the website, you'll see all of our beauty tech transformation, which is amazing. But focusing on our let's say scope, which are operations, I would say I see two major challenges. The first one is tech for take sake. I mean, uh, because it's fancy, because it's uh, cool, because it's hype, uh, we can implement one technology. And this is, to me is a challenge and, and, and somewhat can be a danger because we really need to focus on what, who's our user, what are the pain points, how we can solve this pain point and technology, but applied technology and really, really to solve the pain points of our people. This is the first one. The second one, I would say that digital, and you know it, amplifies and accelerates everything. So it's uh, digital and digital transformation should not be a catch up of performance because if something is not organized and you apply digital, then can be really uh, not organized at all. Uh, and this is also a, a challenge. So we have used um, digital transformation and new technologies in areas where our processes were respected, where we kind of have a mastering the way we were working just to improve them, to augment them, but not to solve or to catch up uh, uh, performance and, and or, or other, other, other things. Thank you, Christina. That's interesting. Um, why I ask the audience already to think about what their main challenges are, because we're, of course, also looking forward to hearing from you. Um, and um, I think, I'm not sure it has been mentioned uh, at the beginning of our webinar, there is going to be ample time for your questions that we'll try to answer uh, between Nicola, Christina and myself. Um, so don't hesitate to type them in. I already see some people uh, discussing about uh, about the challenges they've been seeing. Um, so don't hesitate to do that uh, and think about the challenges you're facing. There's going to be a poll, as you've, uh, you've already seen. Uh, but first of all, uh, Nicola, what are the main challenges that you are facing at Unilabs where you're changing the way you're providing the services, particularly uh, to the doctors? Uh, which are kind of your co-producers, right? Exactly. As I mentioned, in Inad, we have more than 1,000 doctors, and 
you know, let, let's, let's, let's put yourself in the shoes of a doctor who has been using the same microscope on slide for 30 years, you know, those population have been working this way, a bit the old way with a microscope in the closed office with, you know, medical books left and right, checking biopsies with themselves. It's a bit of a lone wolf work, basically, and they really trust themselves. They like to work, you know, in, the, in their closed office and suddenly, you ask them to uh, replace their microscope, trade their microscope, put it on the side, and put two screens on the zooming and zoom out biopsy. So it's a total uh, change for them. So, so of course, the, the, main, uh, the main challenge we face in, in this uh, journey was the resistance of change, Karen. They, they, they were afraid because they were used to do what they were, were they studied at, at school probably 30, 40 years ago. They were used to really do this. They, they trust their microscope, and suddenly you say, "Oh my God, it's a screen!" And you start to collaborate with with your colleagues, which might be across the country or in a different country. So we, we we face some fear, of course, on resistance to change, which is very normal in a in a typical digital transformation. Okay, so here is really about the people factor. So what we see from research um, is that we have five main challenges um, with digital transformation. One is resistance from the existing people, very often because they fear losing their job um, or being replaced by machines. Um, the second one is about changing people's behavior and also changing culture, because we're all aware that uh, we need, in order to, to, to succeed in digital transformation, we need to adopt a digital culture within companies. Uh, the third point, and uh, maybe that's something that uh, we can discuss later on, um, which certainly also exists in, in, in big companies as, as, uh, such as L'Oreal, is the coordination between different departments, or particularly if these are silos. Um, the fourth one, uh, resource const uh, constraints. So not enough money, not enough people to work um, on the digital transformation initiatives. Um, and now my question goes to you, uh, our, our public. What are the main challenges that you are facing? And that's when I would love to see the second poll uh, so we know what challenges we should be face uh, discussing and focus on in the last part of our discussion. Could we have poll number two, please? And I'd love to hear from you. There we go, I see it as well, it's already done okay so it's it's so the main challenge in 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 the room is changing company culture and how people work um it's it's great to see that resistance due to fear of job losses has decreased that's something that we've seen overall also when we look at research it was a main issue about five years ago when digital transformation new technologies have started to to become a big topic at companies uh, but people seem to accept or agree uh, that it's not only about replacing uh, people by machines um, and the coordination issue. I see that. And I see some of you are typing into, into the uh, Q&A um, box. So that's, that's, in, that's interesting to see. And we're here mainly reading about skills and competencies as being a main challenge. Well, then let's start. Um, with you, Nicola, because you mentioned also that uh, your main challenge was to change how people, particularly doctors, work. What have you done to overcome that? So, so I think what we've done, Karen, is is really to involve the doctors in this migration, in this uh, journey toward digitalization. And you know, we pick up uh, young doctors and older doctors, and we train them on the machines. We train them on this new technique. And we ran a pilot with them, you know, showing them um, how those tools were working and basically, uh, you know, showing them the improved medical benefit of, of those, uh, those, those, those techniques, basically. Because what, what is very obvious is the eye of a doctor is not as fresh at the end of the day as it is in the morning, like a surgeon, like a pilot. So, uh, you know, after a certain period, the doctors understand that the machine or the technology, the digital technology is really here to help uh, to improve uh, the outcome and, and improve the, the work. And 
we also we have been discussing a lot to show that the machine will never replace uh, a pathologist. You know, uh, the algorithm, the digital tools are just here to enhance the interpretation of the doctors, to make it safer. Um, I mentioned earlier this collaborative uh, environment, which uh, they really value. We've been also uh, promoting the fact that it creates a lot of flexibility in the work uh, of the doctors, which uh, also they value a lot. Uh, the fact that hey, you you have you have a question on a, a tumor or something, and you can connect with somebody who is in another place of France or even in Europe. We have, for example, a doctor which which is a specialist of uh, ophthalmic uh, pathology today in France in Paris. He's a renowned uh, pathologist for Europe. He's, he's very often uh, questioned. So through digitalization, you can really create a community on collaboration. So. We were actually, actually extremely surprised that at the end of those pilots, some of the older doctors just totally forget their microscope and they love the screen. So very interesting. And uh, you know, uh, today I think uh, when when you regroup with them, they really feel safer uh, with the digital technology. A bit like a you know anti-breaking system of a pilot or a co-pilot in the plane. We would never drive without that today. Uh, you know, why you understand that it's really supporting your, your day to day uh, as a doctor. Yeah, that's, I, I love that example. So I think what is really important is stakeholder management and you talking about the doctors uh, and not nece necessarily about your patients. Uh, what do they gain from adopting digital uh, technology? Um, now, I see in, in our questions a very interesting um, point. Um, about the key success factors to engage employees in digital transformation. And I would like to orient that question directly to Christina, uh, because in operations, it's of course one of the big challenges that you, you've been facing and you've told me about a, a few quite interesting ways to overcome this. Christina, go ahead. Yes, uh, indeed, we will have to involve, both involve employees, but also avoid this challenge of tech for tech's sake is that we really um, put on the shoes of our employees. We listen to the pain points and we don't. Ha we have a limited budget and a limited team at a global digital team. So we make sure that we will involve in the pilots of what we call proof of value um, uh, projects, um, the, the people that you will really use at the end, uh, the tool or uh, the, the, the technology, some, some were as, as Nicola does with, with his uh, doctors. And this allows us to make a great business value because if operational people that has lots of things to do are willing to, let's say, play with us or test something with us, it means that really they see the value that this technology, that this neutral can bring them on a daily basis. And this is key to me uh, to avoid both these kind of uh, just fancy things um, that we can do with technology. Okay, thank you very much. So um, let's just have a, a quick look at the overall imperatives for successful digital uh, transformation, which are based again on uh, quite a few studies with companies looking at what makes a difference between the 30% who succeed at digital transformation uh, journeys and the mainly the 30% who say they completely failed. Uh, and how can you move up? So uh, first point here is the alignment of top management. We started uh, this webinar, webinar discussing the main objectives of digital transformation. So the, the top management, and here I'm really talking about the CEO uh, and his team, need to, to integrate the objectives of digital transformation in the company's business objectives. It, digital transformation is not something in addition to your normal business. It is your business. Um, what is extremely important is not only the, the, the board level, so top management, but it's also one to two levels down. They need to be aligned because that's the way to, to break down the problem of the silos. The second point um, is a focus on execution. And here I'm talking to people who are project managers, program managers. Uh, you've got all the capability that it, that it takes to, to support those executions. So clear prioritization of projects. Um, 
we see in big companies, and I see that as a consultant, but I also see it uh, when I read reports that there are 20, 30, 40 digital transformation projects in different departments and different regions that cannot be handled. There should be maximum five key projects that are organized and managed on a global level or international level if possible. Um, and the rest has to wait. You cannot do everything and transform everything in parallel. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a battle for resources. So um, coordinate all your digital transformation through a single transformation program. That should be extremely close to the top, ideally directly related to the CEO or the board member that, um, that has a digital transformation on the top, very top of their agenda. Now, uh, when we think about uh, execution, uh, we've seen that one of the challenges was a problem of having enough resources. So start allocating uh, your resources quite clearly at the beginning. Uh, and be relatively agile to, to add uh, or change resource allocation as you go in. So you need some agility there, but we need a clear allocation of resource to the different programs. If you only have maximum five, that should be a bit easier than if everybody uh, on a division uh, level tries to, to, um, to get the resources from external partners or from the IT department to support them. Um, and last but not least, uh, and, and that's not surprising, but when we look at companies, uh, it's, it's quite astonishing that we don't see that. Uh, you need to track results. Clear objectives, uh, short term also, you should have clear objectives three months, six months, um, and, um, and a timeline uh, in order to be able to track results. And this tracking should be visible, visible within the organization ideally and we've seen that uh, out of those 30 percent of companies uh, that succeeded their digital transformation or are succeeding the di digital transformation according to their own metrics um, more than half have actually communicated their metrics and kpis the key kpis of the digital transformation to their shareholders so really public uh public commitment there now um it's not only about the execution, but it's also about people. And we've seen that from the Q&A uh, that we've already gotten from you, um, that it's about training people, it's about empowering people to experiment. That's what Christina has also been talking about um, and about allowing them to test how new technologies can add value. Um, I think it might be interesting to go a bit further in, in, into that topic, but I let you decide depending on the Q&A that we get from, from, from you, the, the public. Um, and the last point, and this is something that Nicola has been talking about quite extensively, is you've got to engage with your key stakeholders. In his case, it was about the doctors. Now, very um, basic stakeholder management, you have to think about, okay, what do they gain? Make sure that you put yourself into the shoes of all the different key stakeholders, be it partners, be it employees, be it shareholders, uh, for why uh, do you want to allocate the resources the way you do it? Why do you want to adopt this new technology? Why do you want to test? Um, so these are the imperatives for successful digital transformation that should help you to move from the average failure rate of what well, we've seen more than 60% um, and increase the chances of your uh, digital transformation project um, sig significantly. Now, we're almost uh, 20 minutes to the end of our webinar. So as we said, Q&A discussion is extremely important. I will just quickly ask, um, ask uh, Christina and, uh, and Nicola to share one recommendation, one tip they would like to share with you uh, for making digital transformation work. And at the same time, I would ask you to think about questions that you want us to discuss. And I see we already have a few questions here, um, but don't hesitate to type, type more questions into the, the question box, box and we'll go through them after having heard about the tips from uh, Christina and Nicola. Who wants to start? Ladies first? Go ahead, Christina. Ladies first, then. Thank you. Um, 
my tip, and this is to build on what I've said, is uh, really to put on the shoes of the user, the user being the consumer, the customer, or the employee, and making sure to say what's the value we can bring him or her uh, in this daily job. This is something that's kind of obsession. Uh, what uh, What is the value that it uh, does it brings? Uh, that's why also each time we have a project, we really see two questions. One, does technology answer uh, the, the problem or solve the pain point. The second one is the B case, the business case favorable. And, and only if those ones are green, let's say, then we move forward and we can we can deploy. But really, you know, obsess consumer customer and employee centricity to me is the is the is the key point. Thank you, Christina. Uh, what's your recommendation, uh, Nicolas? I think if you, you know, a few, few tips, I think, um, first, I think creating a sense of urgency. I think it's really important that you explain your target audience on the shareholders that um, there is a sense of urgency. On, in the case of the pathologists, there was an issue of labor, uh, too many cases uh, for limited amount of, of pathologists. So there is no alternative. Second, I would say reinforce the fact that it's not an IT project. Digital is not an IT project. It's, it's really a, a digital journey, as, as you said, Karin. On the last piece, which is probably the most important tip I, I would like to share, is focus with the end in mind. You know, really reinforcing to your audience what are you trying to achieve, and very much like Christina said, the benefit for patient, the benefit for consumer. This is key to motivate your audience. Okay, thank you so much. Well, then let's let's uh, move the Q and A. I see there are really, some really interesting questions already coming in. Um, let's let's not share slides anymore. But uh, I would love to see Nicola and Christina a little bigger, a bit bigger, if that's possible. Um, and I'll I, I'm just looking at the first uh, at the first uh, question here, which is very close to what we've already been discussing, but. Um, uh, so, uh, John is asking, um, my organization is looking at changing its business model. So third type of objective, which is certainly the most radical one. And John says the constant pushback comes from the usual change resistance. How do you move people from how we used to do it versus how we could, should be doing it? So we've talked a bit about, um, stakeholder management trying to get people buy-in because they see value from doing it differently. Any other any other uh, recommendations from your side, Christ uh, Christina or, or Nicola, on that one? You know, I, as, as I mentioned, I think it's, it's really important to, to educate uh, your people on, on share the sense of urgency that uh, digital is, is here to stay and uh, whether you embrace the, this movement or you might be disrupted on the potentially your, your business might disappear uh, tomorrow so the, the, the pathologist whether he resists it in this case huh? i mentioned the pathologist uh he, he knows that he needs to evolve on on transform the way he operates and if he doesn't embrace that you know his job might disappear tomorrow so i don't know if i fully answer the question but i think it's important to kind of lecture the people around the pos possible risk of your business model with this uh, environment. Yeah, so what you're talking about, Nicolas, is, is, is the first step for, for change, if we use Kotler's change curve, it's creating a, a sense of urgency. Uh, yeah. What happens if you don't do that? Now, for some people that can increase resistance, but you'll, you will be able to find people, you say, yeah, that's, maybe we should try and what can help um, is to take those people and to put them together and give them time to try that's what we see when we, we talk um, when we look at 3m when we look at Google uh, who provide um, their employees 15 to 20 percent of the time to work on projects they want to work on so you can do that you can generalize that in order to increase the innovation culture or enhance the innovation culture at your company but you can also do uh, do that on a per person um, basis and say well we want to test this new business model who is who wants to try uh, and then you put them in a garage and I'm a bit extreme here in what I'm saying but you let them experiment um, you let them build a product build a service uh, 
ideally relatively independently from the main organization uh, and you let them launch uh, on the market and normally uh, the success of that of that innovation should prove how important that new business model could be for the old organization um christina from your yeah, side I, 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 I we have a, i have a, a kind of a exercise which is a, a first step of uh, changing mind uh, ch changing mindsets which is a workshop very simple and uh, put your shoes uh, put um, your feet on the shoes of someone that will disrupt your own company so you really change totally the way you look at your company say okay imagine you need to you will kill your company how you will disrupt your company your own company and then it uh, it makes you think really out of the box and then once you see out of the box and you find ideas then you see that it's possible that someone can disrupt your own company so the sense of urgency is there because if you don't do it yourself someone else will do it because the exercise at the end it's uh, not easy but simple and does exist so sometimes it helps on the way of just kind of you know getting uh, to say wow uh, it's a possibility the sense of urgency is here let's move forward so maybe it can be a tip that you can try and, and, and see what, what happens with you people which are re more resistant to, to change. Yeah, that's a very interesting one. Um, but we also find uh, in literature, and this is not only uh, specific to digital transformation, but to change uh, generally, is that it can make sense to, instead of focusing of, on the mass, that's uh, kind of moving relatively slowly, to focus your communication efforts on those the early adopters and the laggards so the resistors and and kind of the the digital um uh, the digital leaders uh and if you turn those two round if you reduce re resistance and let the the the, the digital leaders um uh, try things experiment things um then you have a a chance to to um, gain support for your course a bit faster now there is a an interesting question that uh, goes a bit with that um with the previous one what's the team size uh, that you would recommend to handle digital transformation uh, so a question from jonathan thank you very much for that um and he says as a too small team will not make impact and too big team could lose agility um any feedback from your side and here's it's quite interesting because we see christina in a very large organization uh, and, and 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 division and nicola in 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 a big company but probably medium size if we if we put it into the um into the global picture what's the team size uh, on your side no like christina uh, it's very simple we're 10. so <laughs> there's a large company but the, and again that's you know for the challenge of uh, you know avoid kind of uh, tech for tech sake um it's really make sure that we only coordinate to do this kind of watch of new technologies, but at the same time, we're really close to the to the field, really close to the shop floor uh, to answer the 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 you know the, the pain points to to find solutions to the pain points of our users. Um, as somewhere um, to start, you know the the, the famous thing of uh, uh, think big, start small. I really think that uh, um, results uh, are uh, the the thing that speaks by themselves. So start with a limited scope a limited team limited time true value and then you know we you move forward and you build on that and probably you'll see that your team is getting bigger knowing that to me and again the philosophy um uh it's you need you need a team anyway just to to, to you know do project management and identify things and, and and that's obvious but um use really the resources of your teams because when you're you make people work on this kind of project, then you're transforming themselves. And next time they will be able by their own to find the right partners of innovation uh, to, to change their mindset. And that's why we really move forward through a, a digital transformation for a big company, a large company uh, like, like L'Oreal, for instance, or operations. That's very interesting. Um, so not too big. Uh, Nicola, uh, is there a team managing digital transformation at Unilabs? Not really. I think it's by project, and I know we we are we are on the PMI conference. But I would say, you know, very similar to Christina, I think you know you, sh you should have a very agile and commando type uh, organization, which is uh, 
I would say maybe I would reinforce the fact that it needs to be a multidisciplinary team, uh, which is covering all the scope of the transformation. And uh, as I mentioned, it's not only an IT uh, project, it needs to be very strongly supported by IT, of course, because there will be a lot of interferences in the organization, communication, project management, leadership. Um, also, what I would say is not always, always internal uh, that needs to activate digital transformation. You can also you know, create um, an open forum where you let, let uh, collaborate you, your organization with, uh, with startups, innovators. You can do hackathon uh, to, to Christian points. You can ask them, how would you disrupt my company? And you would be impressed by the amount of new ID you could bring from outside. Yeah, I fully agree. So we are not only talking about internal people, but we're also talking the, the, the digital transformation team that's 100% dedicated to this to this topic um, has the has an important task of coordinating with the external people. Now, I think what we agree on, uh, also based on what the two of you said, but also what research says, it's not the number of people that counts. Um, here, keep it small um, and agile. But you need to have high caliber talent there. So it's really important that if digital transformation shall succeed, you put top, top people on that. Um, it's a sign to the organization. Um, and of course, top people are most likely to, to, to bring better results. Um, what we also see and what leads can lead to failure is that you have a huge team that only works on digital transformation, but it's kind of separate from the organization. That doesn't work. Digital transformation has to take place within the organization. And so you only need a small team to coordinate that program management, project management, uh, partner management, etc. So answer here. I think we all agree, Nicolas and, 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 and Christina and research uh, supports that small team. Um, I would say maximum 10, maybe in, in, in super large organizations, you have 15 people, but that should should be um, should, should be enough. Um, it does not mean that you do not have resources within the organization, right? Uh, that's when we talk about execution and, and resource allocation. Uh, you can demand as a DT team to get, I don't know, five uh, five five people or percentages of some people to help you but you don't want to take them out of the organization or of the day-to-day -day business to just do digital transformation uh, okay um that's a very interesting uh question from clement thank you so much uh we haven't discussed that what about the environmental impact of the digital transformation um is it considered when the project and program is framed is that something that, that uh, you, Christina, are looking at? Um, and if yes, how have you done that? Um, yes, <laughs> uh, we have started to look at it. Um, there's two, to me, uh, there's two things uh, which are important. One is how um, digital and technology can support us on our um, environmentally uh, and, and um, uh, objectives and ambition. And at Laura, we have a big ambition, a big program, which is Laura for the future, with lots of things. And I let you discover that on the website. You know, I could spend kind of hours thinking about that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm convinced that tech and digital can support us on, our, on, on this ambition. And the second one is how we can make sure that digital and technology is frugal uh, we can uh, at least measure the impact and, and and limit the impact and we're just starting on uh, measuring the impact on um, our it on our our technology uh, our algorithms and there's lots of things uh, moving on it's uh, it's, uh, it's something that's starting and and make sure that we we know exactly which is the uh, impact of each of our let's say digital footprint and, and our activities. So we were just starting. Okay. Um, Nicola, any, any considerations on that topic on your side? Uh, it's relatively new um, that we see that emerging. Um, yeah, I, I think it goes hands in hands with digital transformation. Um, I think uh, the medical sector, I would say, was not in the front end of envir environmental 
I think, uh, concern in the past. And I think digital is really helping the sector to try to lead a bit the way in this aspect because digitalization is paperless and paperless is, is good for the environment. So in this aspect, I think we're really improving our footprint. The other option is, you know, telemedicine is, is, is a huge benefit today and has been leveraged a lot during the COVID-19. So it's basically a doctor which is consulting from home on the patients staying at home. So we're also reducing the, the carbon impact by really leveraging digital medicine. Yeah, so what we see in literature, and it's interesting because it's it's just only starting, um, I would say, a year, two years ago, um, we had a few companies talking about that. We see, um, we see business objectives that are linked to the reduction of, of, of the carbon, fo carbon footprint, well, sustainability um, objectives. And if we use digital transformation as one way to reach business objectives, uh, it completely makes sense to, to evaluate what the few projects, well, the few, the, 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 uh, the priority projects in digital transformation actually uh, have in terms of impact on, on, on our sustainability goals. So we see that coming, it's very new, um, but I strongly recommend, um, as I said at the very begin beginning, to make digital transformation a means to reach your business objectives and to include uh, sustainability or goals in your business objectives. Let's look at other questions. Um, yeah, so we have um, an interesting one from uh, Etienne Moreau. Thank you very much for that question. How do you evaluate the value for the final customer and so for, for the company of the digital transformation project? Uh, Christina, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Christina because I remember you were talking about um, about customer insights and leveraging data to personalizing um, uh, products. So, so how do you how do you uh, evaluate uh, the value you create uh, for the final well, customer? Yeah, I, I mean, the final customer is always on our mind. Okay, so when we reduce our time to market, is in order to uh, answer one of the insights, which is which is impatient and, and and wants to see other things. When we create um, a personalization, uh, we think about you know new experiences. Uh, when you go to a point of sale and you do a diagnosis and you have your skin tone and you have your own uh, foundation, which is exactly your skin tone, it's not John number thirty of. Uh, any brand it's really the ones that you, you've done this is a great experience this is personalization um then i have other examples honestly uh, uh which are i mean when when i use my allowance uh, to uh the customer arrives very very late at the end i'm just solving one problem and at the end i'm more agile and at the end he will have his products so, so sometimes it's not that easy but that's why i I, I'd like to 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 use the, the user one, and user can be your customer, can be your client, um, and, and customer, uh, uh, sorry, consumer, customer, or, or employee, and any of those, it's extremely important because you have also this idea of uh, symmetry des intentions. So sorry, my English, I I, I don't know that one, um, but if you want to make sure that um, you are bringing value to a consumer, you need to bring value to your employee. So at the end it goes together and sometimes is easier than others in, in my scope uh, to measure the, the, the value brought to, uh, to, the, to the customer for sure. Nicola, do you, do you want to comment on that one or shall we move to the next question? Uh, I would say it's, it's hard to put a price tag of value. Uh, I think you're really uh, raising the bar uh, by, by using digital technology and digitalization. I think uh, as I explained to you, it, it's really improving the standard of care. So you're basically doing a better job and you're raising the bar. I think we've been trying to measure quality um, improvements and we discovered that some diagnostic, as mentioned, which are you know based on the expertise of an eye of a doctor, make sometimes mistakes, unfortunately. Uh, and we've been able to reduce uh, quality error by almost 15%. So 
So it's, it's really raising the bar overall of what you're doing. And it's a new standard that you need to respect. Um, it's also something interesting is it can also help you to improve um, attraction to, you, to, to talents because really doctors really enjoy this collaborative environment on digital environment. So it also can help the motivation of your, of your staff. So that's a value also as, as an employer. Yeah, I think it's, it's a particularly good question because there is not one answer. Uh, what I often ask um, people and companies to do if it's hard to evaluate uh, the added value is to look at the question from the other side and ask yourself, what happens if we do not do it? And in digital transformation, that's a pretty strong question. Uh, it's a bit close to what Christina has said. Well, what if a competitor does this and we does it and we do not do it? So that might that might be a way to qualify or quantify the value that um, that a project, a digital transformation, um, uh, specific digital transformation project can can bring to a company. Now. As I said before, again, digital transformation pays into the overall business objective. So there, you've got revenues, you've got customer loyalty, whatever you have on your on, on your top um, uh, scoreboard. Last question, well, uh, a quick one, right? Because uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, most companies have quarterly, if not monthly, objectives to meet. Um, how do you overcome the famous S shape of innovation change whereby efforts are huge and returns are limited uh, at the initial stage um, and you thus face a risk that will take too long to move um, the needle and management will kill the project? Uh, question by Florian, thank you very much. So um, my answer is celebrate early successes. And you can define objectives in a way that you, you know if things go relatively well, there's going to be an early success, right? Very quick answer from Christina or from Nicola before we um, move to a close. That, 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 that just to build on what you're saying, Karen, I, I think it's the right one. I, I mean, uh, and that's what I said before. So start with a limited scope, limited uh, um, um, timing and, and, and bring value and, and, and talk about these value and these results and then build on that. Uh, it's the only way to do, to, to do so, uh, I guess. <laughs> okay. Well, time is almost over. So thank you so much, Nicola and uh, Christina, uh, for, uh, for sharing your insights. I hope uh, the discussion we've had was interesting for the audience. We've uh, discussed some of your questions. We've, uh, we've tried to orient our discussion based on your main challenges uh, and your main objectives. Um, and uh, thank you again to PMI and DEDEC Project Management for inviting me. And I'll just hand it over uh, to, um, to my colleagues from PMI to close this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karim. Thank you, Nicola and uh, Christina. Uh, really interesting uh, conference today. Uh, just remind you that this conference was organized by the Paul Côte d'Azur of the PMI and uh, with the really great support of our competency center uh, presented by uh, Luc-André uh, Roche. So thank you. Uh, digital transformation is uh, uh, really, uh, let's say, um, up to date uh, subject. So, uh, I just a reminder, this conference uh, opens to PDUs, so you have there the PDU uh, claim code uh, notice. So uh, for all the participants today, we were almost uh, 600 uh, participants. Uh, you will receive uh, soon an email with this PDU code and also a survey about uh, this presentation. Uh, for those who will be interested, who have missed some part, you will have also the link to the replay. Really many, many thanks to all uh, contributors and participants. And uh, see you in the next event. So next one is uh, the PM Box 7, uh, Les Coulisses. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Emmanuel, thank for the invitation. Thank you. Bye-bye.